As we begin with prayer today, I had asked that if you had prayer concerns that they be shared with me at pastorwest.live.ca or at dwest at firstbaptistbrampton.org. And uh, we've received one this week regarding prayer for those who are on the front lines of, of, um, of our care at this time, doctors, nurses, and those providing food services. Also those affected physically or mentally by, by the virus. Or for those dealing with the, the issues of isolation um, and the um, mental health issues that, that arise from that. Um, and sometimes, in some cases, abuse. Let us remember those people in our prayers. Let us approach God in prayer. Father, as we come before you today, we come bringing the prayer concerns that have been presented to us this week, Father. We, we know, Father, of the, the circumstances that we're facing right now, and Father, we, we come to you as those who, who live by faith, who are trusting you, and who recognize that you are powerfully at work in our lives. And so, Father, we, we bring our requests before you. And Father, we think today of, of those who are caring for, for us, for the doctors and the nurses and, and those that are providing food services and all kinds of other necessary services for us. Father, we put them into your hands and we ask that you would protect their health and that you would be with them in these weeks to come. Father, we also think of those who have been affected either physically or mentally by, by this virus. And, and Father, we ask for your grace and your love to be with each of them. And Father, finally, we think of those who, who are dealing with mental health issues, whether it's um, that they are abusive or they are being abused or, or that they're just struggling with the fears that we are all facing. Father, we ask that, that you would be a real comfort and a, a real source of grace in their lives at this time, Father, that, that you would work powerfully in their lives. Father, as we come before you today, we come asking for your spirit to be among us to instruct us that we might understand and apply your word to our lives for father we ask this in the name of our lord jesus and for his glory amen reading from the 116th psalm psalm 116 verses 1 to 19 i love the lord for he heard my voice he heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servant. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. 
I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in, the mid, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in a sermon on the first chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in a book entitled, God's Way, Not Ours, speaks about the issue of, of what's at the heart of our, our struggle with God. And Lloyd-Jones puts it in this way. He says, that does not end the matter. He's been talking about about the dealing with sin in our lives. And he says, that does not end the manner, matter, unfortunately. The question that immediately arises from Isaiah's words at the end of the second verse is, what makes people rebel against God? Why did the first man and woman rebel against him? And the answer is given us here in abundance. We begin with Isaiah's statement in verse 3. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people doth not consider. Let me put it to you in the form of a number of principles. And he outlines the, the first one in this way. He says, the first principle is this. What is sin? Sin is rebellion, as we have seen. But secondly, sin is that which blinds our mind that leads to ignorance and a failure to think. That is what Isaiah is telling us. Isaiah doth not know, Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. This is the most important matter. This is the great case that the Bible makes against the whole of humanity as it is by nature and by its fall from God. What makes men and women rebel against God? It is sin. And what does sin do? It stops people thinking. The main trouble in the world at this moment is that men and women are ignorant and refuse to think. And the message of God through the prophet is a call to stop and to think and to reason. That's the reason why, as Isaiah outlines it in the first chapter of, of his prophecy, the very heart of that chapter is in the 18th verse where Isaiah says this. He says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They might be red like crimson, but they shall be as wool. That's the issue that the Bible keeps bringing before us. What does it mean to to live in a communion with God? How do we come into that communion? And when we come to the, the, the book of Psalms, to what is called the Egyptian Halal, which begins in Psalm 100 and, in 113 and goes through to 118, when we begin to look at that, those psalms, what we discover is that each one asks us a question. They, they bring us to the point where we are forced to think. And that in thinking, we, we are forced to ask ourselves some questions regarding our rebellion against God and, and just, just what is required of us in order to come back to him. Psalm 113, verse 5. Who is like the Lord our God, the one in, who sits enthroned on high? Psalm 114, verse 5 and 6. Why was it, see, that you fled? Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Why, mountains, did you leap like rams, you hills like lambs? Psalm 115, verse 2. Why do the nations say, where is their God? And so when we turn to Psalm 116, we are not surprised to find that it asks us a question as well. And that question is found in verse 12. 
What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? Now, when we look at that, that verse, and we will do so in the context of the whole psalm, one of the things that we discover is that the very first word translated as what is, is a little particle, a little grammatical particle in the Hebrew language that can be translated as who or what or how. So it's entirely possible that what the psalmist writes here is, how shall I return to the Lord who has been of, of such great benefit to me? How do I return to the Lord? Which is a crucial question for us to ask. How do I come back to the Lord? Now, when we continue on in the, this Egyptian halal, Psalm 117 is just a little burst of praise. But then, in Psalm 118, we come back to the questions. And the question is found in verse 6. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Jesus would have recited or sang that hymn, that psalm, with his disciples just before he went out to the, the Garden of Gethsemane and to the cross. What can mere man do to me? But to turn back to Psalm 116 and to look at what it has to say to us, we discover that this psalm is divided into two halves, that there's verses 1 to to 9, which, which is the first half, and then verses 10 to 19 as the second half. And each of those halves is, in a sense, a mirror of the other half. And the mirror focuses our attention upon two verses which are outside the structure of the, the psalm, which in fact are, are um, little interludes that force us to ask the question. Verse 7, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good or has been gracious to you. And then verse 12, how shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? So I want to look at these two halves around those two interludes. Because what the psalmist is dealing with is this national or personal need that he is dealing with that, that is of such great importance and such great distress to him. He is being afflicted. He is facing great affliction in his life. And, and with that affliction, there's all the uncertainty that we find ourselves feeling today. What is going to happen? When will this end? How can we get through these events? And so we find ourselves facing that type of affliction. And, and as the psalmist looks at it in the first half of it, he of the psalm, he says, that the way in which we respond to the affliction that we're facing is that we cry out to God for mercy. I love the Lord, for he has heard my voice. I love Jehovah, he says, because he has heard my voice and my supplications. I have come before him. I have brought my need to him. And I, I know that he has heard my prayer. He's heard me when I draw near to him. As the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 6 and 7, we are, are brought to those times where we are facing great anxiety in our lives, and Paul writes and he says, Do not be anxious about anything. Tremendous word for us right now. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer 
and petition, or, or as Paul writes it there, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the psalmist begins and he says, I love the Lord. Because he has heard my voice, he's heard my cry for mercy, he's heard my supplications. As I've come before him in this affliction, he has heard me, he's turned his ear to me, and therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me, the anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. Lord, deliver my soul, is what he says. I called upon the name of Jehovah. O oh, Jehovah, I beseech you, deliver my soul. And the Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. In fact, in the first half of this psalm, the word Jehovah appears seven times. It's as if the psalmist wants us to imprint that name upon our minds and our hearts. He is gracious. He is righteous. He is full of compassion. When I was overcome, he heard my prayer and he protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. So we face times where we are brought low. We, we face times where, where we are overwhelmed with the difficulties that we find ourselves facing in our lives. And so how do we respond at those times? And that's where the psalmist steps aside and has a little brief interlude. Not necessarily a musical interlude, although it may very well have been, but an interlude in which he says, return to your rest. O oh, my soul. Literally, he says, Return unto thy rest, O oh, my soul, for Jehovah has dealt bountifully with thee. So he brings us to that point, and he says, Return. Turn back to God. When life gets difficult, when affliction comes upon you, when you are uncertain of the future, what are you to do? Turn back to the Lord. Return to Him. It's a call to repentance. And there are times in our lives where God brings us to that point so that we will repent, so that we will come back to Him. And so he brings us to that point. For you, Jehovah, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I might walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Now, part of our understanding of this psalm is that it is pointing ahead to the, the one who is the perfect fulfillment of all that the, the Psalms are speaking about, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as the Lord cries out in his anguish as he faces the cross, where is he brought to at the end of the first half of this Psalm? He's brought to the point where he says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying to us that no matter what we are facing in this life, 
We are people who have been raised to new life with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are people of the resurrection. We're people who are raised with him. And it's very important that we recognize that. Because as we, we come to this psalm and we, we get to the, the, the call to repentance, to return to the Lord, because he has been so gracious to us, the psalmist then says, you have delivered me from death. Death has been conquered. You have delivered me not only from death, but from sorrow, from tears, from mourning, from stumbling so that my feet might walk before you in the land of the living. The scriptures tell us that our God is the God of the living, not of the dead. That for those who are believers in Christ, what our future holds for us is the resurrection. That we will be raised to life with Christ that death will be conquered in Christ, that we no longer need to fear death because of Christ's resurrection. In the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, as we read the tremendous promise that that, that book holds for us, in the second chapter and the 14th verse, as it is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, it says this, Since the children, since we, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. He became like us. He became human. So that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and set free those who, who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. There's the promise that, that the gospel brings to us. The power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, is broken in the cross. And therefore, we have been set free from our fear of death. What a tremendous promise. That's what the psalmist is saying here. That I might walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I said that the two halves mirrored each other. So when you start looking at this psalm and you come to the second half, what do you see? That the first half ends with this tremendous statement of faith. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I might walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And then the second half starts with this. I trusted in Jehovah when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. Now that's not the best translation of, of those words, because what the psalmist actually writes there in verse 10 is this. I believed, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I believed, therefore have I testified. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, is a passage in which the Apostle Paul quotes from this psalm. And there he says this, and we'll just look at it in its context, so we'll go back to verse 7, and recognize that, that Paul has been talking about the preaching of Christ and the gospel and our reception of Christ and the gospel by faith. And so in verse 7 he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God 
and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that by his life so that by his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with, with you to, unto himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I believe and therefore I spoke. I believed, and therefore I testified. This is where the psalmist brings us to. I believed, and therefore I have spoken, and I am greatly afflicted. I have testified out of my great affliction. But in my haste, in my alarm, he says, I cried out and said, everyone is a liar. Then there's an interlude. Remember, it's mirroring the first half. The interlude comes. How shall I return to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? How shall I return to the Lord? And the psalmist begins to give the answer. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, in discussing his approach to preaching, says that what he always intends to do is to make the text of the scripture as clear as he possibly can. And then he says, once I've made it as clear as I possibly can, I run as fast as I can to the cross. Well, the psalmist is doing that for us today. He's saying, how do we return to the Lord? How do we come back to him? How do we, we do this thing that, that the psalmist is calling us to do by faith? And he says, I lift the cup of salvation. Jesus in Gethsemane, as he's praying, says to the Father, may this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. May this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of Jehovah. Literally, the psalmist is saying there's only one hope. How can we return to the Lord in repentance? How do we receive the salvation that he promises? How, do we, how are we delivered from the affliction that we're facing? How do we find that our momentary troubles and sorrows and weaknesses and afflictions that we face today are to be replaced by an exceeding, weight of glory 
in eternity. How do we find that? He says, I call upon the name of Jehovah. I call out to him. I recognize that salvation is of the Lord. In fact, the name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. I call upon the Lord for salvation, for deliverance. In affliction, in death, which is the ultimate affliction, I call upon the Lord and he delivers me. I fulfill my vows to the Lord, to Jehovah, in the presence of his people. So I fulfill the commitment, the testimony that I've made in the presence of others. But then notice what the psalmist goes on to. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints because that is the entrance into victory that is the entrance into the life of the resurrection where there is no more sorrow or tears or affliction or death precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints but then notice what the psalmist goes on to because he's reflecting on the one who will perfectly fulfill this. Truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. The servant of the Lord comes before God. Truly I am your servant. I'm the one who has been sent into this world to serve the living God. I serve as my mother served before me. So Jesus, when he comes, is faithful unto the Lord, just as his mother Mary was. Let it be unto me as thou hast said. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will, O God. Truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. Therefore I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my, law, my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people, in the courts of the house of Jehovah, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The servant is delivered. He is raised, and all who are in him are raised to life with him. That's the promise that's set before us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 and following, Peter says this, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially. Live out your time here as foreigners in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, Love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring 
word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. The psalmist brings us to this point. And he says, here we are testifying to what God has done to deliver us. He's delivered us and he's brought us out of our bondage, out of our fear, out of our uncertainty. He saved us through his son. And now we cry out to him. How shall I return unto the Lord? By crying out to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. By believing and testifying. With the heart we believe that Jesus is the Christ. That he is the Lord. And with the mouth, with the tongue, we confess that he is Lord. This is the promise, this is the comfort, this is the grace that God gives to us in every affliction and time of need. Years ago, when I was facing heart surgery, I'll never forget the evening before the surgery was to be, to be taking place. Because I found myself, first of all, praying, as you can imagine anyone would pray in a circumstance like that. But throughout that night, I found myself overwhelmed by a sense of peace. What Paul calls the peace that passes understanding. It made no sense, but it was there and it comforted me. That's what the psalmist is calling us to, to experience his presence, the presence of God in the midst of great affliction. Because he hears our prayers and he raises us up. Let us pray together. Most gracious God, as we come before you today, we come so deeply aware of our need. Father, we find that we are weak and needy and afflicted and uncertain in so many ways in our lives. And Father, when we come to you, all we can do is cast ourselves upon your mercy and your grace. Hear our prayers, O oh God. Pour out your grace upon us. Deliver us in our affliction and help us to focus our faith upon the promise of, of God, the promise of the resurrection in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you have done this for us and you are at work in our lives. And so we ask for this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for his glory. Amen.